It's been a while since I've done one of these. Do you ever get one of those crazy ideas that sounds so simple in their premise, you wonder why no one has bothered to think of it that way before? Well, a couple weeks ago, I bought a brand new 12 node server packed with the same APUs found in the PlayStation 5 with the hopes of creating a LAN gaming host on the cheap. Of course, the PlayStation 5 has no exact PC equivalent, and this particular model had been modified for mining crypto, but hey, what could go wrong? All right, I think that's a good enough intro. Let's pour the scotch. Are you struggling to play the latest games because your PC just isn't up to the task? Is your new handheld not quite as powerful as you were hoping for? With Maximum Settings Cloud Gaming, you can get access to a powerful gaming PC in the cloud with the ability to stream a wide range of games and programs to nearly any device. Powered by a foundation of open source software like Linux Mint, Proxmox, Sunshine, and Moonlight, you'll have access to a Linux desktop, all pre-configured with Steam, Heroic Games, Lutris, and more. Virtualized gaming machines start at just $9.95 a month Canadian, or around $7.40 US, and you'll be up in gaming just a few minutes after creating your account. Or for uncompromised performance, opt for bare metal access with an AMD 7800X3D CPU and a Radeon RX 7900XT graphics card. I've demoed self-hosted cloud gaming on this channel before, but not everyone's crazy enough to have a server rack out in their garage. Get the flexibility of a cloud gaming system without the hassle of building and maintaining it yourself. Visit MaximumSettings.com or click the link down in the video description to get started today. And thanks to Maximum Settings Cloud Gaming for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So this is the ASRock Rack for u 12G. And like I said in the intro, it's a 12 node server, each of them packing an AMD BC250, 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory, a single M.2 supporting Gen 3x4 NVMe, four USB ports, gigabit ethernet, and a DisplayPort 1.4. In fact, let me go ahead and turn this thing around so you can see exactly what it is I'm talking about. There are 12 nodes, 12 individual servers, all packed into this 4U chassis. There we go. Each of these nodes is running an AMD BC250, which is a very interesting piece of silicon, as it's the exact same APU used by Sony in the PlayStation 5. It's a custom-made chip from AMD with 8 cores and 16 threads worth of Zen 2 CPU architecture, along with a massive 36 compute unit of RDNA2 graphics power. That's 2,304 shader cores and a 180-watt TDP, making it, in theory, almost identical to a Radeon RX 6700. On paper, you can see why this would be a very tempting package. Not only is this single node as powerful as a PlayStation 5, there are 12 of them. But there's the elephant in the room, and the question of just how much something like this would actually cost. Right now, a PlayStation 5 will run you about $449 for a single console. If you want 12 of them, that'll run you just shy of 5,500 bucks. But this is server gear, and we all know the golden rules when it comes to hardware costs. Gaming PCs cost more than consoles, and servers cost more than gaming PCs. So when the ASRock Rack 4U 12G BC250 debuted in March of 2022, it held a price tag of $14,800. So why such a lofty price? Well, these were designed for crypto mining. Sorry, these were repurposed for crypto mining. And in March of 2022, you could charge just about whatever price you wanted so long as your hash rate was high enough. But what balloons up must inevitably come crashing down. And today, this 4U chassis, stuffed to the gills with gaming hardware just begging to be used for their original intent, was just $699. Shipped. So for just 700 bones, again, we're getting essentially 12 full PCs with what is basically an 8-core Zen 2 CPU and a Radeon 6700. Memory on this platform is entirely soldered to the board and is GDDR6, so you can forget about any potential upgrades. 8 gigabytes of that is dedicated to the graphics card, and the other 8 gigabytes is dedicated to the CPU. However, the system does see all 16 gigabytes as a shared pool, so we could potentially change that split by modifying the BIOS, although those options do not exist as it sits today. But first things first, let's talk about why these individual APUs didn't wind up inside of PlayStation 5s. If we rewind the clock back to 2022, AMD launched a very odd platform they called the AMD 4700S Desktop Kit. 
This was a motherboard that came equipped with a Zen 2 processor on board and 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory soldered down. Sound familiar? That's because this is the exact same APU package, but in the case of the 4700S, AMD disabled the graphics processor entirely due to manufacturing errors. If you want a closer look at this oddity from modern history, Colton over at Hardware Haven recently got his hands on one, and I will drop a link to that video down in the video description. In the case of the BC250s we have here, the graphics APU section is fully intact and enabled. It's the CPU that has some defects here, with AMD opting to disable two of the eight cores, leaving us with six cores and 12 threads. That should actually be more than enough for running each node as an individual gaming PC, especially considering at $699 for all 12 nodes, that's just $58.25 per PC. Now I have a long and sordid history of taking GPUs that were designed for data centers and playing games with them. But I also have a couple failures in that history. Now all of my previous attempts were attempting to create virtual machines with virtualized GPU sharing. Do you know what's easier than sharing a GPU inside of a virtual machine? Just running each of these PCs as a dedicated gaming PC and accessing them remotely. But there's one more caveat that I haven't mentioned about the BC250, and it's a pretty big one. As this APU was designed for Sony, and Sony uses Vulkan as their graphics API, there is no support for DirectX on this GPU. That means gaming on Windows is almost entirely out of the question, at least without developing a custom wrapper for DXVK to translate DirectX to Vulkan, like we do over on the Linux side of things. So the plan from there seems pretty straightforward. Install an NVMe drive onto each of these nodes, install Ubuntu, install a compatible driver, then install Steam and Proton and start playing games. What could go wrong? I started out by just turning on the server and seeing how loud it was going to be because that's also something I've not talked about yet. Each of these nodes are passively cooled with a custom heatsink bolted onto it. Cooling is done entirely by a set of five 80 millimeter fans installed on the front of the chassis. And oh my God. All right, I'm out here in my garage. Uh, I went ahead and plugged in all the nodes. Uh, so there is a power switch on the front of this chassis and it's right here. Uh, noise is gonna be a factor. It's a little loud. The fans have suction to them, like it holds my hand to the front of the chassis. I think we have to address that. These are some of the most powerful fans ever to grace my office. 12 volt at 3.5 amps. These are 80 millimeter fans that can hit 24,000 RPM. These fans are so powerful, they can suck my hand against the case. The only thing preventing me from losing a finger is the grill on the front. These things are terrifying. So rather than stand out at my server rack and listen to this jet engine, I brought one of the nodes inside and powered it up with a standard ATX power supply. Now power inside the blade chassis is connected by these self-centering eight pin connectors right here on the board. But there's also a standard eight pin PCI Express power input if you wanna start up the blade outside of the chassis. Keep in mind, you will still need active cooling and you need to force air through the heat sink to keep it cool, not just blow air on top of it. I propped up a small 60 millimeter blower pointed at mine and managed to keep it under 80 degrees Celsius during installation. Not great, but good enough for testing. Now, I could take you on this very long-winded journey full of ups and downs, successes and failures, or I could respect your time more than mine and just say, I don't think these are ever going to play games. First off, a little bit of good news. Most mining cards or enterprise GPUs that we see have the graphics outputs completely disabled or not even existing. Meaning even if they could play games, there's no way to connect a monitor to them. In the case of the BC250, graphics output is actually enabled and I was able to use the node in the same way I'd operate a regular PC. 
I tested out quite a few Linux distros, including, but certainly not limited to, Ubuntu 2204, 2004, Zorin 16 and Zorin 17, Mint, Mate, and even Chimera OS, and nearly all of them choked as soon as I tried to launch a desktop manager. Now, of everything that I tested, Ubuntu 20 and 22 were the only two that seemed to get me into a desktop GUI. To my surprise, the BC250 was recognized and was running the AMD GPU kernel driver. But things were jittery as hell at best, or straight up crashed at worst. Doing some digging on the BC250 reveals that AMD's internal codename for the PS5 APU was Cyan Skillfish. And while AMD never released any official downloads for this chip, there are references to them adding support for it in a couple of different Linux driver packages. In July of 2021, Tom's Hardware discovered that AMD had added support for this mystery APU in their Linux driver set, but not much was known about it. There was some speculation that it could be an upcoming APU for desktop release, as there were no APUs on the market at that point with RDNA or RDNA2 graphics on board. A couple months later in September, Pharonix noted that AMD added DisplayPort for Skillfish, meaning this could potentially enable desktop and graphics rasterization support. Those two driver releases correspond with driver versions 21.30 and 21.50. And funny enough, 21.50 is also the driver version that most point to as having compatibility for crypto mining, at least according to some forum posts around using the BC250 inside of HiveOS. And thus began my three days straight of installing Ubuntu, downloading AMD proprietary drivers, compiling, booting into the OS, and testing for functionality. Now, during this time, I did see some success. At certain points, I managed to boot into a desktop environment with full 1080p graphics, and 2D acceleration appeared to be functioning. Windows would drag smoothly, animations were fast and snappy, and even 4K playback through YouTube worked like a treat. But with every success came an equal amount of failure. On most kernel versions, the AMD driver would fail to compile. If I successfully compiled the kernel driver, I had what seemed like lower than a 10% success rate of also getting Vulkan properly installed. Even when Vulkan properly installed, it seemed to default to software rendering rather than using 3D acceleration from the graphics card. To run as a remote gaming machine, I also needed remote access. And similar to my Vulkan install attempts, even when the graphics drivers fully compiled and installed, I had maybe a 10% success rate when trying to install Sunshine for desktop streaming. And the one time I was actually able to connect from a client, I was met with about one frame per second on the remote client, meaning video encoding was likely not functioning. In the end, I tried compiling nearly every combination of drivers and kernels that I could get my hands on, from 21.50 all the way up to AMD's latest proprietary driver stack. And not a single one ever rasterized a single polygon. And outside of 3D rendering, most other components of the APU seem to either be severely compromised or not functioning at all. Going for broke, I decided to try and install Windows because maybe I could hack together a DXVK wrapper and make these finally work. But even after modifying driver installers and templates to recognize the BC250, every single install attempt there also ended in failure. But hey, even if these can't play games, maybe there's some other uses for this hardware. I mean, it is still $58 per node and a 72 core cluster with 192 gigabytes of memory, right? First off, if I wanted to use only the compute side of this APU, remember that each CPU only has eight gigabytes of memory, not the full pool of 16. So we're immediately limited to just 96 gigabytes total for the entire server. While these are Zen 2 cores, they're also limited to just 3.5 gigahertz, meaning performance is actually somewhere around Zen 1 performance on a core by core comparison. Chips and Cheese also just did a breakdown on other compromises in the design of the BC250 on the CPU side of things, most notably the FPU being completely nerfed, as who needs high-end compute inside of a gaming console? If you're interested in the nitty gritty details, I will leave a link to that article down in the description as well. But the biggest issue, aside from terrible compute density and pitiful memory capacity, is the fact that each node idles at around 85 watts. That's not including the nearly 200 watts of fans on the front of this chassis. Just powering on a single node and having it sit at the BIOS screen will consume 85 watts of power. I ran a quick benchmark of Cinebench R15 when I had Windows installed, and peak power just stressing out the CPU was around 166 watts. 
Now, I've talked about this quite a bit before on the channel, but I hate seeing hardware get used for only a couple years and then immediately become e-waste either due to a lack of support or short-sighted decisions by the company that made it. If it's possible to reuse a data center GPU or a Xeon server or a cast off APU and have it serve a purpose in my house, I feel that's a win-win for every party involved. The conversation around the AMD BC250 is likely a bit more complicated as well, as again, these were APUs designed specifically for Sony to put into PlayStation 5s. It wouldn't surprise me at all if AMD was only given the green light by Sony to sell defective units as other SKUs, so long as they disabled the ability to rasterize graphics on the GPU. And that's why we wound up with a desktop kit featuring this exact APU with fully disabled graphics cores. That's why we got mining cards and this 12 node server without the ability to install GPU kernel drivers. If AMD were to sell a fully working BC250 APU with eight cores and 16 threads, along with 36 compute units of RDNA2 graphics, that package could potentially undercut the PS5 in total cost while offering identical performance. If you were Sony, is that something you'd ever allow hit the market? I'm a hardware enthusiast and I love sharing my passion about this, but I also feel that means sharing both my wins and my losses. If this project would have panned out, I could see servers like this running entire LAN gaming cafes. Imagine a pair of these servers powering 24 gaming PCs that are nothing more than thin clients attached to a monitor. But it seems that use case is just not meant to be, either because of incomplete drivers, incompatible kernels, a lack of graphics APIs, or just straight up classic corporate contractual agreements. So. That's it then. This former mining server chassis is going to be added to my list of to never try again, right up there with the GP104 mining GPUs or trusting AMD's promise to deliver license-free drivers for SRIOV virtualized GPUs via their Radeon Instinct GPUs. Now on that note, I'm sure the comment section is going to be filled to the brim with potential use cases that I'm missing because I'm just an idiot, right? But I'll remind you again about the insane power draw requirements. This server would require 1100 watts just to turn it on. Power draw could easily hit over 2000 watts when stressing out either the CPU or the GPU on these as well. Given the fact that I don't think these GPUs will ever be useful outside of OpenCL or mining tasks, 2000 watts is an insane number and wholly inefficient. If you want some actual usable performance, for the same price, you could easily build out a couple of Haswell dual Xeon systems, have more memory, higher multi-threaded performance, and significantly lower power draw. But what do I know? I'm just some guy with a YouTube channel. If you do have an idea, feel free to leave it in the comments below. I'm sure it'll enlighten my whole outlook on life. On your way down there, don't forget to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider going on over to craftcomputing.store where I've got rocks, glasses, and whiskey stones if you also have a habit of buying things on eBay that will never work. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Scotch makes everything better. Highland Park 12, because f this thing.